Sometimes in life you get a lesson, and because you weren't careful, you have to get it again. Hopefully, the second time around, you will learn. That's exactly what happened to me. Let me explain. When these events took place, I had just turned 25 years old. At the time, I was a personal transportation consultant. That's what my business card said. In truth, I was a car salesman. I only tell you this because it helps explain my train of thought at that stage of life. My name is Jake Stedman, and I was a very good salesman, especially if the customer was a woman. At the risk of sounding immodest, I will say that my gruff appearance, six foot one height, and athletic body helped me when dealing with female customers. I was a man, if I may say so. So I was successful selling to men as well, but my success rate with female clients was about 75%. Among my accomplishments was a more than 50% success rate in selling some romantic extracurricular activities to ladies. I was great at getting them into bed, at home, in a motel, or even in the back seat of the car I had just sold them. I was outgoing, brash, and a little cocky, and I believed that my lifestyle of making money, partying, and getting as many women into bed as possible was the only way to fly. One night, before heading out in search of young beauties, two friends and I discovered a restaurant called Smuggler's Inn. It was sort of like an expensive red lobster, specializing in steaks and seafood. The food was better than average, but the real attraction was the bar lounge. The lounge had a great DJ, some unremarkable booths in the back, and heavy-handed bartenders pouring me Jack Daniels. We went back there at least once a week just for the lounge. It was a rich target audience for young ladies. The third or fourth time I was there, I met Beverly. Beverly Vitale was a waitress who sometimes worked in the lounge if the dinner trade was slow or if the lounge was very busy. She was a classic Italian beauty with long black hair and a body designed to drive men crazy. I know I wanted her the first time I met her. Beverly brought drinks to the table for me and my friends. She smiled when I tipped her for the service, and I took her left hand to examine it. What? said Beverly with a smile. I was wondering if you were married. I don't like breaking other men's hearts when I take their woman, I replied with a smile of my own. The smile left her face. She jerked her hand away and headed back to the bar with anger in every step. My friends laughed at Beverly's obvious refusal. I guess you didn't hit the bullseye, Bill teased me. You pissed her off so much that you'll never be able to get close to her now, Tom suggested. Oh, you of little faith, I proclaimed. Give me two or three weeks and I'll have that girl over to my place for the weekend. A month tops, I boasted. None of my friends believed me and began to pick on me. A small bet was made and I put my plan into action. If I won the bet, not only would I get $200, but I would have Beverly as a playmate for a while. It was scouting time. I needed information on Beverly. The next night, I waited for my favorite bartender, Sam, to take a smoke break and followed him outside. Sam, what's up, buddy? He greeted me. We talked for a bit, and I asked, Any word on Beverly? Yeah, I saw her stomping away from your table last night. What did you say to her, Jake? I recounted the incident at the table, and Sam just shook his head. You really went overboard with that sentence. Sam gave me some information about Beverly. She was married but separated from her husband, Jerry, though not legally, and was trying to get a divorce. Jerry was abusive for over a year and even hit her a couple times. That's when she left him, took her maiden name, and moved in with her parents. Apparently, Jerry fought the divorce and did everything he could to delay it. Beverly's father and two brothers beat Jerry to a pulp when he showed up at the family home for the second time. After that, he had the good sense to stay away. During the year that Jerry bullied her, Beverly met Joe, the assistant bar manager at the restaurant. He overheard Beverly talking about the problems she was having with her husband and hatched a plan to become the man in Beverly's life. Joe began to sympathize with her problems and give her verbal support. He was able to make her believe that he was concerned about her and truly cared for her. Beverly was in a vulnerable state and believed his delusions. According to Sam, the sympathy and support expressed to Joe helped Beverly a lot after the way Jerry treated her. She fell in love with Joe, and two months after separating from her husband, Beverly moved in with Joe. 
Her husband, Jerry, became furious when he found out about Beverly and Joe, and she had to get a restraining order to keep him away from her. He realized what was involved when she arrested him a second time. When Sam finished his story, I said, no wonder she reacted so badly to what I said. Unpleasant topic for her, huh? Well, I'll have to smooth it over and see what I can do to make her feel better. I wasn't confident if I wasn't cocky, but I was also more than a little self-centered. It never once occurred to me that maybe Beverly didn't need more stress in her life. I didn't care about other people at that moment. What mattered was what I wanted. Sam had another piece of information for me. Things are not smooth and peaceful between Beverly and Joe right now. They are fighting with each other at work. Joe seems to be spending all of his check and most of Beverly's check, too. He likes to go out with his friends and play high roller. It must be like deja vu, because that's exactly what her problem with Jerry was. They had a little fight last night, and Beverly's not happy about it. I didn't usually date married women. I had an experience that turned me away from the idea. About three months before Beverly, I met Jackie at a bar, and we became friends. The next night was a Saturday night, and I took her out to dinner and then to a dance. Later that night, we were relaxing in her bedroom after a romantic interlude. We had just fucked each other. And there was a knock on her front door. A damn loud knock, like someone was trying to kick the door in. Jackie looked out the window and with a lot of fear in her voice said, It's my husband and his brother. Oh my God, if he finds you here, it's going to be very ugly. She told me that they were legally separated, divorce papers had already been filed, and the divorce would be final in another 30 days. That didn't help me now. I put on my pants and shoes and told her to let him in, but held off for about a minute. Uh, he won't find me here because I won't be here when you let him in. I'll go out the back door and go around the front of the house. When you let him in and close the door, I'll get to my car and cart out of here. As I approached the house, I heard Jackie ask what he needed. Her husband said he wanted to talk to her and had brought his brother to keep the situation from getting out of hand. He then asked her to speak to him in a softer voice. Jackie opened the door wide and let both men in. As soon as the door closed, I ran to my car and got the hell out of there. I know, what a coward. Maybe so, but in a fight with her husband and his brother, I wouldn't stand a chance. Besides, I just met Jackie. We weren't in love. Nothing good would come of it if I ran into her very large and very angry husband. Two weeks later, walking into a tavern, I saw Jackie sitting behind the bar. She was sitting next to a guy who had his back to me. As I made my way towards her, I saw her eyes get really big, and she shook her head in refusal. I walked past them and sat down at a table. After ordering my drink, I looked at Jackie and the guy she was with. It was her husband. Jackie made sure to meet me in the hallway leading to the restrooms. She told me that they were back together, going to counseling and trying to work on their relationship. I wished her luck and told her to call me if things didn't work out, as if I would ever be in that position again. But then again, sometimes the little head makes the decisions, and your good intentions take a back seat. Back to my search for Beverly. The next night, after talking to Sam, I decided to wander around the bar. I hoped to catch Beverly as she was ordering drinks from the dining room. Finally, after about an hour, she walked over to the service end of the bar to get her order. She saw me sitting behind the bar and tried to ignore me. I walked over to her and tossed a 20 on the tray. Beverly looked at the money and at me with a question in her eyes. This is the tip you should have gotten last night if I hadn't been such an ass. I apologize for my behavior. Please forgive me. I finished, retreated to the other end of the bar and ordered another drink from Sam. Beverly didn't understand what was wanted from me and kept looking over my shoulder as she carried her order to the dining room. Every time she approached the bar to place her order, she looked at me. Every time she looked at me, I smiled and raised my glass in greeting. Finally, after three or four times, she smiled back at me slightly. Success, I thought. Now she has forgiven me and I can move on with my life. I left shortly after she smiled back at me, but watched her, hiding from her gaze at the entrance. When Beverly returned to the bar, she looked around the room for me. I had planted the seed, now we had to see if it could germinate. After that, I returned to the lounge every evening. In the second week after surgery, Beverly was already talking and laughing with me. I didn't push her, but I let her know that I was interested in her. At the end of that week, I asked her out on a date. I can't, Jake. I'm living with someone she replied to my invitation. 
Maybe so, but I hear things aren't going so well right now. Let me show you how a lady should be treated. Beverly smiled, touched my arm, but shook her head in refusal. Okay, I thought. I lost this skirmish, but the war is not over. I continued to laugh and joke with her for four more days, and then fate, or gremlins, or the devil intervened. Tuesday night, Joe and Beverly had a big fight at work. I found out about it from Sam and tried to be especially charming whenever I saw her that evening. Wednesday night, I asked her out again. Hey, Bev, I have tickets to the George Thorogood concert Friday night. Come with me and I'll show you a good time. I knew she'd kick Joe out of their apartment Tuesday night. Maybe that's just what I need right now, a good time. Yeah, I'll go with you, Jake, thanks. She looked happy to have a chance to blow off steam. I work a short shift on Friday and get off at six. I'll bring a change of clothes to work with me. Can you pick me up at 6.30? Not only will I be with a beautiful girl tomorrow night, my date is being paid for by two of my buddies. Let them pay for betting against me. The next night, I took a dozen roses with me for Beverly. I didn't know when I set out for the smugglers, but my splendid plan was about to go down in flames. I arrived at the smugglers at 5.45, deciding to have a drink and talk to Sam while I waited for Beverly. Pulling into the parking lot in front of the restaurant, I saw an ambulance with coroner written on the side. There were also at least eight police cars parked in front of the building. Something serious was going on, but I had no idea what. Entering the building through a side door, I made my way to the waiting room. Sam was sitting behind the bar talking to a man in a suit, obviously a police detective. I sat down at the other end of the bar and Sam brought me my usual drink. What's going on outside, Sam? Looks like every cop in the neighborhood is out there. Bartenders always know what's going on. Sam started babbling and explaining to me why the cops were standing out front. Joe didn't have a car since Beverly kicked him out of the house and his father was driving him to work at five o'clock. The car stopped in front of the employee entrance and Joe sat talking to his father for a few minutes when Jerry came to the passenger window. Apparently, Jerry figured that if Joe wasn't around, Beverly would come back to him. Or maybe he just wanted to get back at Joe for living with Beverly. Or maybe he was tired of suffering because of Beverly and decided that if he couldn't have her, he couldn't have Joe. Whatever his motive, Jerry walked to the car, stuck a 12-gauge double-barreled shotgun out the window, and fired both barrels. He then sat down on the ground next to the car to wait for the police. Joe was nearly cut in half by the shotgun blast and died instantly. His father was shot several times in the left side, but other than shock was not seriously hurt. It was he who called the police. The cops arrived, arrested Jerry, and took Joe's father to the hospital. Sam revealed that after a little investigation, they took Beverly to the police station. She wasn't in trouble. It was just that the police wanted to know the whole story leading up to the murder. The detective approached me, introduced himself, and asked if I knew Jerry, Joe, or Beverly. I admitted that I knew Beverly, but only because she sometimes waited for me when I came into the living room. The detective looked satisfied and returned to the scene. I left the break room and headed home. On the way, I thought about the fact that I could have been in Joe's shoes. If he had gone to work earlier or stayed home, Jerry would have caught me with Beverly. I wasn't Joe, but I might have made a good substitute in Jerry's mind. I never went back to the smuggler. It had lost its appeal to me. I never saw Beverly again. All of this happened almost 40 years ago. I never dated or chased married women again. Thank God after that death incident, I started to grow up little by little because I was a real bastard at the time. The only married woman I lust after now is my wife. We met and married about three years after the events of Smuggler. Our children gave us a cruise around the island for our 35th wedding anniversary. Over the years, I've had to dust off a few overly amorous men. My wife was and still is a very attractive woman. The men I've discouraged have gotten off easier than the ones my wife has handled. When she is angry, it can be a real temper tantrum. When fate, karma, or whatever is trying to teach you a lesson, heed it the first time. Because if you need a second time, it can bite you in the ass. I learned twice not to mess with married women, and it could have been fatal for me. Finally, lesson learned. Life goes on.